Thanks, Alan. James, are you ready to get started? Yes, I am, Adam. Thank you for checking. All right, great. I'd like to kick us off here. It's 930. Welcome, everybody, to the um, South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Task Force sponsored uh, workshop for the integrated delivery schedule. Um, this is, a, again, a task force sponsored workshop in response to the formal request from the Army Corps of Engineers on July 7th, uh, at the Working Group and Science Coordination Group meeting. Um, going back a couple of task force and many years ago, um, the task force had requested that this be updated on a yearly basis uh, with all the progress of restoration and um, funding and and how the schedule and, and our sequencing of projects is changing. Uh, I know this is a big lift for the Corps uh, and the district and others involved in restoration, but it's a, a great way to communicate and visualize uh, where the progress and all the progress is going towards restoration um, in the programmatic approach to um, um, rehabilitating the, the landscape. Um, again, for those that are new to the uh, IDS, the Integrated Delivery Schedule provides an overall strategy and sequencing of planning that I'm sure the core will be getting into in their presentation, design and construction of projects throughout the entire system. Um, for those not aware, James Erskine on the call today with us today is the chair of the working group, um, and he will be helping to facilitate this along with uh, Alan Childress and Sandy Soto from the Office of Everglades Restoration uh, Initiatives. Um, and we have some housekeeping um, to do. And so it, just be patient with us to make sure that everybody's on the same page that's in attendance right now. Um, and, and really um, thank you so much to the core and the district and others that participate in, in the development of this. And uh, hats off to Alan for keeping us all uh, moving in the right direction. So um, anyway, I'm gonna turn it over to James, sir, your turn. Adam, thank you very much. For the record, James Erskine, Chair of the South Water Ecosystem Restoration Working Group and Chair for today's workshop. Today's workshop is being recorded and webcast, so we ask that all participants manage their microphones and videos accordingly. I'd like to start by thanking the Ecosystem Restoration Task Force members for hosting the workshop today, which will provide an opportunity for agency staff and public to engage on the integrated delivery schedule. I would also send a big thank you to the Office of Ecosystem Office of Ecosystem Restoration Initiatives for facilitating the technology for facilitating the meeting and providing the technology for today to make it possible. In addition to our speakers today, which include Tabitha Elkington, Dan Crawford, Danette Goss, and Zulamet Vega Larano, we have a panel of agency staff available for the discussion portion of the agenda. From the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, we have Ava Valles, April Patterson, Tim Geisen and Tasso Kokuvis. Joining us from the South Florida Water Management District, we have Nafriza Huzanini, Mindy Parrott, and Jennifer Leeds, and Andrea Atkinson from the National Park Service. The presentations today will have a question and answer session and a public comment period for all of our participants. Up next, I'd like to ask Alan Childress to provide an overview of the workshop process, including today's purpose, the feedback loop from the workshop to the USACE and the South Florida Water Management District, and web page information. Alan will also explain how stakeholders can participate throughout the workshop. Alan, please take it away. Thanks, James. Thank you, everyone, for participating today. It is a, a big lift and a very intergovernmental effort to, to get us all to this point. So I appreciate everyone's participation today, as well as all the effort leading up to this workshop. Um, as a general note, um, if you're a participant and have joined us on our Zoom, you will be muted until it is time for public comment and you wish to provide that. Just to let you know, we will be controlling the, the mute and unmute. Um, and we have as, as Adam had mentioned, we are responding to an official request of the Corps of Engineers to hold this workshop on the IDS. It's in addition to, uh, we have blanket approval for annual workshops on the IDS, but they also specifically requested one this past summer, knowing that they'd have a finished product this fall. Next slide, please. And we have done this for quite a while. We have been working hand in hand with the core and bringing these workshops to you. Hopefully some of you have participated in the past and will be familiar with the process. And we've been doing annual workshops since 2019. Next slide, please. 
we're trying to, um, even with the Zoom platform, trying to enable more of a two-way dialogue, getting some questions and answers for you during today's workshop. And the results of this workshop, all the information from the, the chat session and verbal comment will be provided to the core in the water management district formally from us um, at the conclusion of the workshop. Next slide. So welcome today. If you have any difficulties with the Zoom platform, we are also um, webcasting this live. The link is available on our website, evergladesrestoration.gov. It is a YouTube link to a live webcast. And for participating today, we will have two ways for you to provide input to us and participate. Next slide, please. The first way is via the chat. This is what we are utilizing and have used in the past to in, get to that two-way dialogue where you're able to pose questions. So depending on how you are viewing Zoom, um, you'll see a, utilize the chat feature, a chat box will come up and enter your message and that will be sent to the panelists. Next slide, please. And then April Patterson from the core and I will be taking turns relaying those questions to the panelists and we'll try to group them as much as possible and facilitate any follow up questions that you might pose in a timely manner. We try to do that um, as nimbly as possible for you. So that's one way to get questions and answers is via the chat box. Next slide. We also will have the typical public comment that will occur at the end following this chat session where you're able to provide verbal comments and you can use the raise hand feature in Zoom to provide these. And once your hand is raised, we'll take note of that. Next slide, please. And then we will be calling on you one by one and letting um, people know who's on deck to be ready next. And we will unmute your microphone and um, depending on the time allowed, that we have left in the workshop, we'll have a timer to help guide your comments and keeping it in the time allowed so we can hear from everyone during the workshop. Next slide. And all of this information is available on evergladesrestoration.gov. We will have all the proceedings, summaries, and the a, a recording of the video will also be available as soon as possible. And to be provided information on any upcoming meetings at the bottom of every page on our website. There's a stay up to date section where you can sign up for email reminders of upcoming meetings. And James, that is all I have. Thank you very much, Alan. We have a number of we have a number of participants today and I'd like to just take a moment and thank our working group and science coordination group members for joining us today. And also thank task force member Alligator Ron Bergeron for joining us today. We have some special opening remarks from Lieutenant Colonel Todd Polk and Jennifer Reynolds. Lieutenant Colonel. Hey, thank you, James. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to today's workshop for the 2022 Integrated Delivery Schedule update. Uh, you know, the Integrated Delivery Schedule, or IDS, as you know, it's our roadmap uh, for the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Program. Uh, the goal of the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Program is to improve the overall health of 2.4 million acres of the South Florida ecosystem, including Lake Okeechobee. You know, we're currently making unprecedented progress towards that goal and it's reflected in this year's integrated delivery schedule update. Increased funding over the last few years, plus the additional $1.1 billion in the bipartisan infrastructure law have helped spur on the momentum in the program, including really award of two major construction contracts for the SEP EAA um, uh, project, representing $380 million investment. The SEPA project is going to provide that much needed capacity to store water south of Lake Okeechobee and make more water more readily available towards Everglades National Park and Florida Bay. We've had unprecedented levels of active construction contracts. Seven Everglades restoration projects <clears throat> are currently under construction, representing a billion dollars of the federal investor investment under 12 contracts. And just this week, two days ago, we issued the notice to proceed for contract 10A that's the seepage and inflow outflow canals for the EA reservoir. You know, we hope this ID, IDS is a useful tool for all of our stakeholders and the public and we want to see our accomplishments now and what's remaining to be done for America's future, ever, America's Everglades. I wanna thank the OERI team for hosting today's workshop and South Florida Water Management District and their continued partnership and collaboration on Everglades restoration and development of this, of this IDS. I also wanna thank our members of the public you know, your engagement and participation in today's workshop <clears throat> is always welcome, and we appreciate your questions and comments. I'd like to thank our USA staff and team for presenting today, Ms. Tabitha Elkington, 
Dan Crawford, Danette Goss, and Zulmet. And of course, Tim Geist and April Patterson, Tasoko Groves, and of course, Ms. Ava Velez. And finally, I want to welcome <coughs> South Florida Waters Management District Director of Ecosystem Restoration and Cap Capital Projects, Ms. Jennifer Reynolds, and hand the stage over her for her comments. Thank you so much for that, Colonel Polk. Uh, it's an honor to be here with everybody today as Adam and Alan were going through some of the people who are on the line. It's probably not lost on anyone that the brain trust of Everglades Restoration is on this workshop today. And so I just wanna thank everyone that's on the line and all the people who aren't on the line and are busy working on all of these projects because Colonel Polk really outlined the momentum that we have going on in restoration right now. And it is tremendous. We've waited a long time to be where we are today. And it's a time to celebrate what we're doing. It's a time to keep the momentum up and to look forward to a future where the Everglades continues to be the lifeblood of Florida. And so we're honored to be a part of this. Um, we all know that the integrated delivery schedule is something that we all carry around with us. Um, that's not gonna change. And we look forward to the presentations today and participate in the discussion. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Polk. Thank you, Jennifer Reynolds, for getting us started. Such positive words is very true. It's hard to keep track of everything that's going on, but right now, Tabitha Elkinton and her team are gonna give us the keys and the method to keep track of these projects. Tabitha, take it away. Thanks, Ms. Eriskin. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's workshop. I'm very pleased to be able to present to everyone the 2022 update of the integrated delivery schedule. Um, and just for a little bit of background, the Integrated Delivery Schedule, or IDS, as Lieutenant Colonel Polk mentioned, is the roadmap for the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Program. It reflects an optimized schedule and sequencing strategy for planning, design, and construction that's based on engineering and science. The IDS also serves the purpose of the Master Sequencing and Implementation Plan described in the original SERP Yellow Book, and it's updated on an annual basis. Um, this year, we've held two informational sessions, um, stakeholder listening sessions, provided an update to the working group and science coordination group of the task force. And we also presented the working draft just this past October at the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Task Force in DC. And today we'll be presenting the IDS, the 2022 IDS update. And as you can see from these images, the IDS includes two different pages of information. Page one includes investment information and also project schedules. And page two includes information on operations, operational planning, recover, which is our science and monitoring program, and also updates on the original SERP yellow book components. So my presentation today is going to focus mostly on the content included in page one, and our other presenters will cover the detailed information in page two if you'd like to, like to follow along. The IDS is also currently available on evergladesrestoration.gov, and there's two versions. There's one version that's easy to view on your computer, so you can see both, both um, pages, and the other is just optimized for printing, and it notes that on the website. So we welcome everyone to print that out or check it out on the, on the website and take a look and follow along um, with us. So with that, we'll move to the next slide, please. So next, I'd like to just highlight some of the progress we've made in FY22 and FY23, what we're going to be doing this fiscal year. Um, so we've got, as we mentioned, a lot of momentum with projects. First, um, the Picayune Strand canal plugging started construction in fiscal year 22. The Broward County Water Preserve Areas, C11 Impoundment, is currently in final design. The Central Everglades Planning Project L67A structures um, have received bids and are currently in the procurement process. The S356E East Pump Station and S334 East Gated Spillway are in design and we anticipate construction award this fiscal year. And Gated Spillway 355 West is also in design within, with anticipated construction award this fiscal year. 
Um, we also um, awarded the construction contract for the EA Reservoir and Foundation Wall this past September. Next slide, please. A few more highlights from some of the information on page two of the IDS. The Southern Everglades study will kick off this fiscal year. That's a, a new study we're going to be starting. Um, we'll also provide a little information on that. And FY22 and 23 operational planning efforts will be active across all regions of the system. So that's a really big deal, noting that we're starting to move more and more pieces into operation to start delivering benefits to the ecosystem. And then we've also updated the SERP 68 components, those original yellow book components that are on the back page of the IDS. And one of those components has moved into completed status, which is the C44 Basin Storage Reservoir. Um, we're also excited to talk about the new recover module in Southwest Florida, and we'll have a presentation covering that as well. Next slide, please. So next, I'm going to start stepping through the IDS section by section. So again, for those of you who might have it handy or want to take a look on the website, you can follow along as we go through each section, and I'll kind of talk through the contents and some of the highlights. So this image is the upper left-hand corner of page one of the IDS. It includes a table showing total South Florida ecosystem restoration investments through 2021. That's that big table there. And note that you can see totals for the core and Department of Interior and combined total of federal investment, um, and also a total of non-federal investment, which includes investments from the South Florida Water Management District. Total federal and non-federal investment in the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Program through 2021 was $7.4 billion with an additional $1.6 billion that's been invested in Herbert Hoover Dyke rehabilitation, and an additional $2.2 billion has been invested in restoration strategies and the Everglades construction project. So you can see just a massive amount of federal and non-federal investment towards America's Everglades and our restoration goals. You can also note at the bottom of this image, um, you can see a legend. This provides the key that helps you read the project schedules that appear below. You can note that the color indicates whether or not it's being led by the South Florida Water Management District in blue or black if it's being led by um, the Corps or Department of Interior. So if it's a federal led process or non-federal led process. Um, you can also note that the different iconography indicates what stage the project's in. So if it's currently in construction or if the operational plan is de being developed, if it's in the design, PPA, and execution phase. So all of those icons indicate kind of what stage that project or project feature is in. Next slide, please. This table shows um, the funds received in FY21 and FY22. FY23 reflects the president's budget and the governor's budget. And FY24 and beyond are projections based on the optimized schedule included in this year's IDS. You can note again that color corresponds to whether or not something is federal or non-federal. And you can also note that these are fiscal years rather than calendar years. And then we also have indicated which years we anticipate a possible Water Resources Development Act bill where new projects could be authorized. So just indicating that as well. Um, also note that the top line planning estimates federal construction cost, that row also includes allocation for the bipartisan infrastructure law funds starting in 2022. So from 2022 on, that includes our allocation for bill funds. Next slide, please. Next, I'm gonna start stepping through the project schedules on that integrated delivery schedule. These are all organized in color-coded sections based on the year the projects were authorized. Um, the first section includes non-SERP and foundation projects. A couple highlights on this slide. Um, Herbert Hoover Dyke will be physically completed this fiscal year. And it's also going to provide the conditions needed to update the operations of Lake Okeechobee. Currently, I'm sure some folks on the workshop today have participated in the LOSOM workshops. Um, if approved, LOSOM will serve as that new operating schedule for Lake Okeechobee. I'll also note that the Kissimmee River Restoration Project is physically complete and is currently in post-ecological monitoring. 
Next slide, please. This slide covers SERP Generation 1 projects or projects that were authorized in WERDA 2007. And I'd like to highlight that the Picayune Strand Restoration Project feature canal plugging began construction in FY22 and road removal is nearing completion. So we're making some exciting progress in Picayune Strand. Next slide, please. This one covers SERP Generation 2 projects or projects that were authorized in WERDA 2014. Um, the Broward County Water Preserve Area C111 impoundment is currently in the final stages of design. And the Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands Phase 1 construction is well underway with some features anticipated to complete construction and move into operational testing and monitoring this fiscal year. Next slide, please. This, include, this includes the Central Everglades Planning Project, which was authorized in WERDA 2016. Um, as we noted in the highlight slide, we've got a, a bunch of major milestones for different set features that have been completed or will be completed in FY23. The Central Everglades Planning Project L687A structures um, have received bids and are currently in the procurement process. The S356 East Pump Station and S334 East Gated Spillway are in design and we anticipate construction contract award in FY23. The construction contract for the EAA Reservoir Foundation and Cutoff Wall was awarded last month, or yep, last month, a couple months ago now, sorry, in September. And the SEP EAA Seepage Canal and Inflow Outflow Canal is currently under construction. So it's exciting to see some of these features beginning to move forward for SEP. Next slide, please. Next, um, Generation 4, um, Loxahatchee River Watershed Restoration Project was authorized in WERDA 2020. This is the most recently authorized project. And project features are currently in the design, PPA execution, and real estate acquisition phase. Next slide, please. So this is the, the last section at the very bottom of page one, and this includes current planning projects. There are currently three planning efforts underway, including the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project, the Western Everglades Restoration Project, and the Biscayne Bay Southeastern Everglades Ecosystem Restoration Planning Project, or BBC. -er. Um, we also noted earlier in the highlight section that we'll be kicking off the Southern Everglades study in FY23. Next, next slide, please. So next, just a quick orientation to page two. Um, you can see on the left-hand side, there's information, a little bit of background about operations and operational planning. We've also got a table below on the left-hand corner that is, shows the schedule for our operational planning efforts. There's also um, some Im information on the Recover, um, the new module in Southwest Florida. And then to the very right hand side, you'll see that large map that that includes the current status of all the Yellow Book 68 components. And some of our other presenters are going to be highlighting these various sections of the IDS on page two. But wanted to take a moment to kind of quickly orient you to each section. So with that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Dan Crawford. He's a senior water resources engineer with the Corps of Engineers, and he's going to be providing an overview of operational planning. Thank you, Tabitha. Confirm an audio is still coming through clear? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, you can proceed to the next slide, please. Uh, so the, the, the bottom line with operational planning is that, you know, we all, those of us who are involved and live in this SERP program day to day, we spend a lot of time on the front end of these projects, planning them, putting reports together, doing our technical evaluations. But the, the bottom line is where we get the benefits is after we build these, these features. And sometimes it can be, you know, it can be three, five, seven, even 10 years or longer sometimes on these projects between the time that we're working through the, the PIR and the planning phase until we actually have the infrastructure fully built out on the ground. And so over the life of these projects, there's requirements in the CERT program to just continue to make sure that we're keeping our operational manuals current and we're considering new information, whether that's 
regulatory information, new endangered species information, or just the fact that there's a whole bunch of projects that are all moving in parallel. And the way we, or, so the way we organize this very complex central and southern Florida system as we move forward and implement these CERP projects is we have them organized in what's termed system operating manuals. Um, you can see at the, the map on the left, the, the spatial location of each of the system operating manual volumes. There's seven total. Uh, volume one is a system-wide authorization volume that doesn't have any specific projects in it. It just talks about the overarching CNSF project as we move to implement SERP. Um, and you can see the other spatial locations for the other volumes. So as you have, if, as you noted from Tabitha's presentation, each of the little project numbers, the P's on the map, correspond to the projects on the front of the IDS. So if there's a particular project of interest that you want to follow, this map gives you a good cross-reference for which system operating manual volume those operations uh, reside within. Um, the way that system operating manuals are organized, I know the graphic at the bottom right is not perfect, but generally speaking, system operating manuals contain everything. You can think of those as kind of your your owner's manual for the, 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 the folks operating the Central and Southern Florida project and all the CERT projects, all of that information is tucked within the system operating manual or the SOM. Nested within that is the infrastructure that's built today and the day-to-day -day rules for how to operate the system. When do you turn on the pumps? When do you open the spillways? When do you turn them off? How do you consider constraints such as you know, threatened and endangered species, canal level constraints, et cetera. That's all codified in the water control plans, which are our day-to-day our -day operations. And then the project operating manuals are developed only for the SERP projects. And so what those contain is all the rules on how you're gonna operate the complete set of SERP infrastructures. These are done for on an individual project by project basis. And they contain the rules that are applicable only to the CERT project that don't necessarily fall under the broader region, regional water control plan that this project operating manual corresponds to. Uh, next slide. Um, for I won't read these, but these are definitions just to put at your handy disposal. So if you want to go through and and understand how the delineation between a, a SOM, a POM, and a water control plan work out. These, this is this is the slide that's got all that one-stop shopping available for you. Uh, next slide, please. And so the, the graphic on the, the, the bottom left on the back side of the integrated delivery schedule. So I always encourage people that when you, you know, print out the IDS, make sure you print it out on two separate pieces of paper so that you don't have to decide which side's looking up. Um, there's a lot of really important information on the back side of the IDS. And what you can see is for the, the, the five the volumes of the system operating manual that are covered. Again, volume one is system-wide authorization information. Volume six is actually for the upper St. Johns River water control manual. So that doesn't have any CERT projects. And so that's why it doesn't get a home on the IDS as we're focusing on the, the South Florida ecosystem restoration. But for the other five volumes, volume two being uh, Kissimmee, volume three being Lake Okeechobee and the Everglades agricultural area, volume four being the water conservation areas, Everglades National Park and the South Dade Conveyance System, Volume five being the East Coast Canals and the new volume seven being Southwest Florida focused on the, the Picayune Strand SERP restoration project. So across these five volumes, you can see the, the box highlighted in green at the right. Um, those are all the projects that are at some phase of operational review during fiscal year 23, during the next 12 months. Uh, you can count them. There's a total of 20 of them that are in an ongoing state of evaluation and there's actually going to be six of these that will have a national environmental policy act a nepa document on the street at some point in time during this fiscal year for for public input and agency review 
um, the, the footnotes, um, the, the ones and the twos, um, we'll, we'll go through them in a little more detail later on, but those footnotes are actually denoting which projects will have a external facing uh, NEPA document that'll have a very robust public engagement process versus others that are more uh, administrative updates just to reflect um, updated design information. Um, and then we also track because these these bars they're not just the bars on the graphic aren't just showing the time duration for the public facing NEPA process it's actually the full breadth from when we start talking about design updates to when we do update the documents all the way through the completion when these project operating manuals get approved at our South Atlantic division and so those durations include modeling durations as well. We know that can be multiple months on these projects. Um, and so the, the footnote number one covers the ones that will have NEPA. Footnote number two covers when we're gonna have a hydrologic modeling. And generally speaking, the bars that are longer are the ones that have that hydrologic modeling component tied to it. And we wanna make sure working with the SERP Interagency Modeling Center and, and the great uh, technical modeling team we have down there, uh, we wanna make sure that we're planning these projects well in advance so that they don't all end up stacked up on top of each other. So we have a very, we use these IDS updates as a tool to help make sure we're, we're sequencing the work and make sure everything keeps moving along smoothly. Uh, just a little bit on terminology, um, what we're working through with, with, with the implementation of SERP as required by the programmatic guidance, the programmatic regulations 2003, is there's a requirement to convert what our existing rules are to the format that includes all the information we need to operate CERT projects. And so, you know, we have sets of rules. Those current sets of rules are master water control manuals. And through the CERT process, we're converting them into system operating manuals. Water, water control plans are, are exactly the same under current CNSF and future CNSF as we move into SERP updates. Existing master water control manual has no CERT projects in it. And so that's why we're developing these project operating manuals is so you have a, a place to codify how you operate the components of the CERT projects to realize the benefits and achieve the objectives that were identified in the PIR phase of each of those respective projects. And that's, so that's where our project specific information resides. And the, you know, we have USACE, uh, Corps of Engineers, engineering regulations that dictate exactly what these documents look like and the programmatic regulations add a few additional bells and whistles that are required for the, for the CERT projects. So the bottom line is there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, we're touching all different volumes of the, across the entire spatial footprint of the Central and Southern Florida projects. Uh, next slide, please. The Psalms and palms don't have to be scary. Um, it's, I know it's a, it's, a, it's a big terminology, but We've done this before for, for folks who were involved in the 2020 combined operating plan. Um, well, it was about a four or five year project to getting to the finish line. You see at the right is the, the water control plan that was written for COP actually includes all the same information we have for our project operating manuals for SERP because we're trying to this this COP effort was the first time that we completed one of the conversions from a master water control manual to a system operating manual. And so the only differences, I highlighted them in the little blue boxes, are that we have new additional requirements for SERP, such as water reservations to ensure that we protect the water that's needed to achieve the SERP benefits of a project, and then the requirement for uh, savings clause to make sure that we're cognizant of maintaining the level of service for water supply and flood protection consistent with the pre-project condition to ensure that SERP is not causing an adverse change to water supply or flood protection uh, users. And then we also have placeholders as the SERP periodic SERP update process, there's also a feedback loop where that information gets reflected in each of these water control plans. And then at the left, the left just illustrates the outline of a system operating manual, just highlighting that the water control plan is just one chapter within that broader system operating manual. And what the other chapters of the system operating manual tell you is, you know, what makes it work? You know, like what, what is the overall setting in which this water control plan or project operating manual is situated? How has it been operated historically? What are the rainfall runoff characteristics of that watershed? 
how do we get real-time data on what the conditions are on the ground to help inform our operational decisions? And then we also include summaries for uh, the, NEP, the, NEP, the NEPA, what are the environmental effects that we're expecting across the system from implementation of, of this set of operations? So this is the process that we're gonna be going through for each of the spatial volumes of the system operating manual. So we've done this, the first time was for volume, volume four with implementation of the 2020 COP. We're doing this now for volume three, which is the process that's happening in parallel with the Lake Okeechobee system operating manual. So those are processes where we had an active operational study going on and we were taking advantage of that active study to go ahead and do this administrative update to convert a master water control manual to system operating manuals. We're also gonna be doing that for the other volumes, but the other volumes don't have parallel operational studies happening at the same time. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a graphic, you know, this highlights why do we have to do this? Why, why do we have to change? You know, we spent so much time on the front end of these projects putting together PIRs that include project operating manuals. And those project operating manuals are baked in the information we have at the time we're doing those respective PIR planning studies. So we assume what the status of the exist, other existing projects are across the CNSF system that may touch and affect the project. And we assume a set of operations in the future on how that individual CERT project's going to work. You know, the, the box at the top left just illustrates, you know, what information do we have at the time? We're, we're making our, our public scoping process. We're developing our base conditions. We're typically not going out and collecting, it, collecting additional site-specific information. We're using what we have on hand. We go through a very robust alternatives formulation modeling process for, for folks working on BBC or, you know, we're in the middle of that process right now. You know, we're making risk informed decisions because we don't want to get tied up in the quicksand. We want to keep all these projects moving forward and get them to authorization so that we can start to move into construction and get these projects built and realizing the benefits. You know, we do our flood protection water supply analysis for the savings clause. And we, we have a very, uh, conceptual design level and a general vision for how we would like to see these projects implemented. So if you look at the, the, the graphic in the middle of the slide, that just illustrates the chronology of how we update these operating manuals for CERT projects and how they continue to evolve in the life cycle of the project. So at the left, the orange box is what we have at the PIR phase. We go through all this information, we get these PIRs written, and then we submit them to Congress and we wait for a word of authorization and to get appropriations to move out with design, construction, and implementation. And that, that process can be multiple years in waiting. While we're waiting, things are still changing around us. The only, the only constant in the world is change. And so there's always other components of the CNSF system that are moving parts, you know, all these public meetings that we're having, those are all providing a feedback loop into this process. And so the next phase we go into is not once we have a project authorized, we move into the design, detailed design phase, um, and eventually the construction phase. Um, the terminology changes a little bit um, for project operating manuals in the PIR phase, they're called draft project operating manuals or DPOMs. Once we come out of the construction phase, we call them preliminary project operating manuals or PPOMs. Why do they change? Look at the, the box at the top right. You know, we have a lot of new information. We have, again, all these other, what I would term parallel projects that are, that are working in parallel that have a feedback loop are adjacent spatially or the water flows into the same basin of a given CERT project. We may have post authorization changes. We may have new input from tribal consultation, from coordination with Fish and Wildlife Service on threatened and endangered species. We have always opportunities for public and agency input that crosses bounds between, between projects. We have to get permits to be able to move forward with construction of these projects. And we may have limitations on our cash flow in terms of how long it's going to take us to implement some of these multi-billion dollar projects. We have the opportunity to go out and collect site-specific information. And then we take all this information and we make sure that 
throughout the life of the project, we're always continually checking our savings clause requirements. And we're, we're working through getting plans and specifications developed. And as we consider our, our cash flow timeline and real world implementation constraints, we will update our construction schedules. What all that means is that the, the preliminary set of operational rules that we laid out several years prior, we have new information. And so we wanna take that new information and update it into these, these preliminary project operating manuals. And then again, once we get it built, we still have a feedback loop. We, we build these things, we test them, we make sure we're realizing the benefits as we are intending through the operational testing and monitoring phase. We may make additional adjustments. And then at that point, we would have what we would term a, term a final POM or a, a F POM. Um, projects that have gotten to that point are, to this point, are picky and strand. And, and that's why you haven't heard heard that term dropped around too much is because it's been the initial two pump stations for Picayune that have reached that, that final POM phase. And then as with all CERT projects, there's an adaptive management feedback loop that you're continuing to implement over the, the multiple years as you move forward with real-time project implementation. And then there's always an opportunity to go back and revisit your operations at any point in time that you have meaningful new information. So what we'll see is if, you, if you're looking at the front side of the IDS, each of these phases is denoted on the front side of the IDS, whether we're in feasibility phase for those projects at the very bottom of the front page, whether we're in the design and construction phase, which is the dashed lines on the IDS, or whether we're in the OTMP phase. And so we have those 20 projects that we're working on some phase of operations this year, they all fall across this spectrum of initial planning phase, design phase and construction phase or in OTMP phase and looking to just optimize the operations to, to maximize the achievement of benefits at the earliest possible opportunity. Next slide. I think the best way to realize this is to see, see this in, in a case study. So Central Everglades planning project, uh, we're about to embark on a scoping process for updating the operations for Central Everglades, so the time is appropriate to use this as an illustrative example. Um, we had the PIR for SEP was done back in 2014. We have two phases to date that we've laid out that we're going to be operating the operations manual or three phases. We've already done one, which was the initial construction contract for the L67A gated culverts that was awarded back in 2020 um, that we had to reprocure um, due to some challenges with implementation of the construction in the field. But we did do an initial update back in 2020. And we also used that opportunity to, to, to fold in some of the, the, the recent, the then recent updates from the Everglades Agricultural Area project and the word of 2018, word of 2020 updates. But moving forward, you can see starting this fiscal year, we have what's termed SEP 1.0, which is our, our next opportunity to, to gain additional benefits as Tamimi Trail construction is completed by the Park Service and Florida Department of Transportation. And then we have a second phase that's a little further afield that will coincide with completion of the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir. Uh, next slide, please. This just illustrates, you know, at the bot at the left is what we have what we have in our hands right now. Uh, we have a, a project operating manual was written back in 2014. We did some administrative updates to incorporate the EAA project in 2020. And we have the COP combined operational plan, water control plan that was implemented in 2020 for the set of infrastructure that you can see on that graphic. Um, at the far right is where we expect to be in 2030, you know, eight short years from now, we expect to have the full complement of Central Everglades planning project built, including the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir and Stormwater Treatment Area, the conveyance improvements in to get more water into the northwest corner of 3A so that it can pass, flow through its natural flow path across Conservation Area 3A into Everglades National Park. We're constructing the new Blue Shanty Flowway in Southwestern Conservation Area 3B and having that water flow naturally and making that southwesterly turn in Everglades National Park once we raise water levels in Northeast Shark River Slough and degrade the L67 extension levy. So there's a lot that changes from where we were when we developed 
the COP plan in 2020 to this new set of infrastructure at the right when all of SEP is built out in, in eight short years. And our goal operationally is to develop a set of inter interim operations that further and build on the ecosystem benefits that we're already seeing from implementation of COP at the earliest opportunity and make sure that these operating manuals are reflective of the construction, constructed components as they come online. So as soon as a new feature comes online, we want to be able to realize benefits from operating that feature. We don't need to wait until the full portfolio of set projects is completed. And so there's a lot of things that have changed from where we were, we wrote the original 2014 SEP project implementation report, not the least of which is COP, which was, was an unknown back in 2014 on where the COP process was going to land. And then again, we've had, we're always, ha just to illustrate how things are always changing, you know, we had the word of authorization in 2016 that authorized the SEP recommended plan from the 2014 PIR. And then we had the, the Section 203 report and subsequent word authorizations in 2018 and 2020 that authorized the EAA project. And now you've got another 160,000 acre feet of water that is captured from the northern estuaries, is able to be sent south through these storage features and through the Everglades and ultimately down to Florida Bay. So our goal with operational studies is to all this, we don't wave a magic wand and have all this infrastructure appear out there tomorrow. It's going to take us a long time to design, construct, and get these features built. But we want to make sure that we're realizing benefits all along the way because the, the ecosystem can't wait. Next slide, please. And so step 1.0, this is just a, a plug. Um, the public scoping process is going to get started in January on this project. What we're aiming to do is, again, I, I've talked, you can see at at the, the panels on the right, the construction that's going to be completed. Um, panel A is all the new distribution in Northern Conservation Area 3A from the SEP North features that the South Florida Water Management District is taking lead on design and construction for. And then panel B is all the South, SEP South phase components that include the Blue Shanty Flowway and the, the L67 extension degrade to pass more water into Shark River Slough. Um, all this work is supposed to be done by 2028, 2029, if you cross-reference the front side of the integrated delivery schedule. So what we want to do, the, the first domino to fall will be the Tamiami Trail roadway, prosing, roadway raising that's being done by FDOT and the National Park Service. Uh, that project is going to allow us to raise the operational water level on the L29 canal um, at the top end of Northeast Shark River Slough as early as late 2024, early 2025. And so we want to have a plan that's ready to, to send more water into Northeast Shark River Slough when those components are done and when we can benefit from the new water that's going to be moving south from the, the, Lake, the new Lake Okeechobee System Operating Manual that should be implemented by June of 2023 and potentially some of the other projects that will be coming online in parallel. So there's a list at the bottom left of some of the projects that are new information since we developed the COP project back in 2020. Um, it's not an exhaustive list and we haven't made any decisions yet on the scoping process for this SEP 1.0 operational planning study. Again, that process will get kicked off in, in January. Goal being to have something in the ground by early 2025, coincident with completion of the Tamiami Trail Next Steps roadway raising project. And so we have about two, two to two and a half years to complete this study. Um, we'll work on getting the maximum number of components put into that project that can ensure that we can have an updated operational plan ready to go, coincident with the roadway reconstruction being done. Uh, this is just phase one. Um, the next slide, please, is just a, a quick illustration of phase two, and this is that we're going to do another relook because the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir will come online in approximately 2030. This will be a much more complex effort. We anticipate that this would also include a relook of the Lake Okeechobee regulation schedule, but we want to make sure we get through LOSUM first. And this, this study, this SEP 2.0, will be the effort that looks at the Lake regulation schedule as a part of SERP implementation. And again, since we're talking about implementation in approximately 2030, uh, there's a lot of other features in the integrated delivery schedule that will come online between now and then, including like the Broward C11 Reservoir. Um, we should have information from the periodic SERP update. Western Everglades PIR may be authorized. And so this step 2.0 phase would be 
the the bucket that will capture the benefits and for implementation of all of those projects in a comprehensive holistic perspective next slide I only have two more slides. Um, what I've done here is just kind of the bottom left just illustrates again the life cycle of the project that I went through. So starting from PIR phase through design and construction, uh, the design and construction pieces are on the next slide. But what we do here is just kind of highlight how you can cross reference the, the information on the front side of the IDS with the operational studies on the on the back side. Um, so we have um, the system operating manual updates. Uh, again, we're, we, we're all tracking the update for Lake Okeechobee system operating manual, which is volume three. Um, that's part of an active operational study, similar to how COP was done for volume four. Um, volume two for Kissimmee and volume five for East Coast Canals, those are not accompanying parallel operational planning studies. They're just administrative conversions of our existing master water control manuals into these SERP system operating manual format so that that process is done as we start feeding in the project operating manuals for the individual SERP projects. Uh, item two is a set of projects that as soon as we're done with the operational updates, we immediately go into implementation. And that includes Losum in 2023, the phased implementation of Kissimmee River restoration in 2023, the longer term operational transition plan for moving into full headwaters revitalization schedule for Kissimmee. That one doesn't have a completion date until 2025. Um, some administrative updates for COP related to the seepage cutoff wall that's been constructed around eight and a half square mile area. And then the SEP operational phase 1.0 that again we're starting scoping on early next early next year. So again, these 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 two slides illustrate the 20 operational planning studies that are in some play, some focus, some area of degree of focus during this fiscal year. Not all of them are completing this year. Um, and again, I highlight the footnote in the top right that there is a, a note one is for items that will have public facing NEPA. Note two is items that are are going through the interagency modeling center um, with some degree of regional modeling associated with them uh, number three is the planning project so this is the the three projects on the bottom of the front page of the ids that are in the pir phase um, that we will have initial draft project operating manuals developed in parallel with completion of those those pir studies uh, next slide and the next slide talks about the later phases once you've got a project authorized and you're moving through design construction and implementation we're still continuing to have these operating manuals evolve to reflect all the new information so kind of starting with the ones that are closest to the finish line first um, projects that are in operational testing that have already been built like the c44 reservoir there's a relook at those operations scheduled to start also in 2023 to, to optimize that project to, to work with the new Lake Okeechobee system operating manual. There is a number five is the projects that we're working on operational manual updates coincident with either construction completion or initial operational permits. And that includes the A2 stormwater treatment area, uh, C43, Biscayne Bay phase one, and Picky and Strand Miller Canal plugging. And then number six is the projects that are a little earlier in the design process and having in terms of moving into implementation and construction that we're just updating our operating manuals to reflect our current status of design prior to getting construction permits for, for those projects. And that includes IRL South, C23, C24, North and South Reservoirs, uh, Broward C11, and then later this year, once we get through C11, we'll actually immediately jump onto the Broward's 3A, 3B seepage management features. Um, you know, these, these are moving targets. Again, we've got 20 different projects that are in some state of operational revisitation during this year. So the footnotes just indicate, you know, that as our PIR phase schedules adjust or as our design timelines change if we have complications during design or during construction, these schedules are fluid. That's why we update it once a year on the IDS. It kind of gives us the best snapshot of where we are at this current point in time so that all the, all the interested stakeholder and partner agencies kind of can track and maintain uh, visibility on these efforts through time. I think that's it. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dan. Um, now I'd like to introduce Ms. Danette Goss. She is a senior project manager in our ecosystem project section, and she'll be presenting information on Recover, including the new Southwest Florida module. Thank you, Tabitha. Can I get confirmation of audio? Excellent. Good morning. Hey, my name is Danette Goss, and I'm the project manager for Recover, which is a truncation of the words restoration, coordination, and verification. And that's in light of the Everglades restoration and SERP, it's a science arm to ensure that our SERP implementation is achieving its goals. Uh, the monitoring arm is the adaptive and assessment monitoring piece, which is the monitoring arm of Recover. I'm gonna to talk to you today about who and what Recover is and some exciting changes that have occurred this year. Next slide, please. So who is Recover? Recover is a diverse group of 10 different agencies, two uh, tribes. If you look at the bottom of the slide, you can see the logos of our participating diverse team. Uh, this group provides an interdisciplinary team and it's made up of scientists, technical people, planners, biologists, and, and modelers. And this diversity adds to the system-wide perspective that Recover the goal of Recover is to provide a system-wide perspective on Everglades restoration. So having diverse backgrounds, diverse opinions, and diverse scientists help with that. Recover staff provide technical evaluations to ensure that SERP goals are achieved, and we communicate those evaluations in science upward and downward to both for the vertical team management as well as to project teams. Next slide. So what is the function of Recover and roles of Recover? As I said, SERP, Recover provides a system-wide um, perspective on SERP. And as we know, SERP is a marathon and not a sprint. So as things evolve and things change, we learn things. And in Recover's role is to learn and implement the latest science because over the implementation timeframe of SERP, a lot of things have changed and a lot of data has been collected and a lot of things have been learned. So what one of the functional roles of Recover is to ensure that we're using the best available science, the latest science, the newest things we've learned to ensure that we've implemented those things and apply them appropriately, both to planning projects, projects in implementation and in operations. So again, it's system-wide and it kind of helps provide an overview because Projects are all isolated, but our waters aren't isolated. The Everglades system isn't isolated. So what Recover and the team does in their functions is provide everything working together because we know these water is not isolated per project. So the three missions that Recover has is assessment, evaluation, and planning. So the assessment that ties into the monitoring arm that I was mentioning, it's measuring performance of projects and data through monitoring of different species, different parameters in order to understand the impacts of our projects on SEP and Everglades restoration. Once that data is obtained, um, the data is evaluated. Um, it's used to forecast project performance. There's, there's modeling and performance measures that tie into the evaluation process. And then the last piece is planning, and that's integrating what we've learned throughout the SERP program in both the planning, design, construction, and operation phases of the system. So all these three pieces work together to help improve performance and to ensure we're achieving SERP restoration goals. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna to talk to you about how is Recover organized. Um, this is basically a simplified org chart of Recover. The top level is the Recover leadership group. This is a team that functions essentially as a board of directors. Um, for Recover. Um, it provides content, consensus decisions in a forum for agency perspectives to get together. Um, below at the green box is the Recover Executive Committee. It's a smaller group that works on a day-to-day -day basis, um, kind of a conduit between the board of directors, the leadership group, and regional, or I'm sorry, and the teams. Uh, the next level below is the blue boxes. It's the, you'll see there are regional teams, which are geographically oriented. And then there's five-year plan subteams, which are task-oriented. So some of the tasks you can see are integration, adaptive management, project support, 
communication, which is sharing all that science between different projects and between groups, and then water supply and flood control. The box to the left is the regional teams, which we're happy to share. We had last year when we reported this, there were four modules and they're based geographically on regions. And as you can see, the circled red is our, the new thing that has occurred this year. We've added the Southwest Florida module. If you look at the map graphic to the, in the middle, there's a amber or orangish yellow area, which defines and shows the Southwest Florida module, um, which we're so happy to have done this. It provides essentially a means to evaluate SERP across the entire footprint. Um, it fits with our system-wide perspectives and our functions of recover. Next slide, please. So this is the new Southwest Florida module. If you look at the legend on the left, there were three influences or justifications that warranted the inclusion of a Southwest Florida module. And the first piece, if you look at the numbers in red, those correlate to the 68 components, which are listed below in the table. And that also correlates to the 68 components that you will see on the back of the IDS. Now, if you look, there's a lot of 68 components in the Southwest Florida region that, that justified capturing um, this evaluation or capturing recovers insight and evaluation. Uh, the second piece that justified or influenced uh, the need for this section is the, it's a yellow line, and this is the conceptual ecological model. It's the boundary of the big cypress, and it helps influence the need for this section. The last piece is the SERP project. So if you look in the black boxes, um, Dan had mentioned Picayune Strand. To the left, you see is Picayune Strand Restoration Project, which is in construction and nearing completion. And then to the right, you will see the Western Ever Everglades Restoration Project, which is currently in the planning phase. So the model or module boundaries, in addition to inf being influenced by ongoing projects in the region, were also influenced by the regional hydrology, which is the watershed, as well as the eco ecological conditions. This area is a little bit different than the river of grass with, with forested wetlands and with different fire conditions. So we felt it warranted, in addition to the many other things I've just stated, warranted the addition of this new module to help implement a full system-wide perspective. Next slide, please. So what are the next steps for the Southwest module? Seeing it was just introduced, the first things that will happen, we'll develop assessment tools. I uh, will just develop conceptual ecological models, which determine drivers, stressors, and ecological effects. As I mentioned, Big Cypress um, model was developed in 2005. This will be updated and it will be used as a basis for an update, as well as there is a coastal mangrove conceptual ecological model also. Um, the next step would also be the hypothesis cluster, clusters, which were identifying the minimum variables that need to be monitored. We'll have to develop monitoring plans, which help us um, look at our performance measures, which are essentially a quantitative measurement of restoration targets. And they, they're, the pieces of a performance measure are the metric, what is our target, and what is the spatial extent of where we're monitoring that. So all those pieces feed into the need for developing a monitoring network in order to develop a plan to measure what is going on in this new module, which brings us back to providing full evaluation for SEP overall. This new module adds the big piece and allows it to model SEP its entirety. So we feel like it's a really great addition and we're happy that it was uh, implemented and I think it's gonna bring us a lot of great science and we'll learn new things and be able to implement them from a system-wide perspective. And with that, I will send it back to Tabitha. Thank you. Thanks, Danette. Um, now I'd like to introduce Ms. Zulema Vega Liriano. She's the planning technical lead in our watershed planning section.
Good morning. How about that, everyone? Sound check? Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, as Tabata mentioned, my name is Sulamed Vegaliriano, and I'm currently a senior planning technical lead uh, in Jacksonville District uh, for Ecosystem Restoration Planning Studies. Next slide, please. So just as a reminder, the Central and South Florida project, first authorized by Congress in 1948, is a multi-purpose project that provides flood control, water supply for municipal, industrial, and agricultural uses, prevention of saltwater intrusion, recreation, groundwater recharge, water supply for Everglades National Park, and preservation of fish and wildlife resources. Uh, the effects of the Reno CNSF project on the hydrology have included a change of the natural timing, quantity, uh, quality, and distribution in South Florida. And therefore, the 68 components um, are the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan um, that were authorized in WARDA 2020 and are intended to restore the quantity, quality, timing, and delivery of water into the Everglades. In this slide, I just want to highlight a couple of facts um, uh, that I found really interesting about the 68 components. And that way we can have a ground, um, a common ground understanding of uh, some, some aspects of the 68 components. One thing that I want to highlight is that these components have been labeled with letters, um, as an example, component A, or as an other project elements, or also known as OPEs. Also, a component can be a new or a modification to infrastructure, or even an operational change uh, of the CNSF. Congress provides additional authorizations to start construction of one or more components um, under Water Resources Development Acts or WARDAS. These authorizations are the mechanism uh, in which components become federal projects. On that note, I would like to highlight that the first 10 SERP components were authorized in WARDA of, 20, of, of 2000. Also, I want to note that since then, uh, several components have been authorized for construction, completed, or even implemented. And you can find uh, a status of all of these components um, in interagency documents like the South Florida Environmental Report, a product from South Florida Water Management District, or in the Integrated Delivery Schedule, uh, which is a, pro a product from the core and that we're talking about today. Next slide. So where can you find the 68 components in the IDS? So on page two of the IDS, you will find the list of yellow book components um, with their names and their codes. This is on the second page, uh, on the right of the second page, as you can see in the illustration. The example showing the slide um, uses, uh, uh, as, a, uh, as an example, the location of component G, which is the EAA storage reservoir. Next slide. So um, at the beginning, I mentioned that a project um, is a combination of one or more yellow book components. If you're a visual learner as me, um, I hope this slide helps you. Uh, here is an example of how a group of components became a federal project uh, through Water Resources Development Acts of 2016, 2018, and 2020. On page one of the IDS, you could see the project locator uh, with the yellow book component letter and the project name, as you can see in at the bottom left of this slide. As an example here in the slide, um, we're showing the Central Everglades Restoration Project, or CEP, which is a combination of nine components, which are listed in the slide. 
for your reference. Next slide, please. As I mentioned previously, um, the South Florida Environmental Report also provides a status of all the components. Uh, in that report, the components are grouped in regions and they show a total of eight regions. And in this slide, it's just a reminder of a snapshot of the comparison between the different regions or area names that are listed with their corresponding restudy components and yellow book. And at the bottom, you can see a link to where you can find that report. That report is updated in an annual basis. Next slide, please. So we have, we use some status terminology in the IDS that I, we want to walk you through. Started uh, uh, counterclockwise, we have at the top left, the authorized design construction status. This means that a component is part of a project that has been alpha, uh, that has been approved by WARDA and it will start or continue implementation activities. Next, um, on the blue uh, area of the schematic is the planning feasibility uh, status, which just means that a component is currently being evaluated for future implementation. Next, going counterclockwise, uh, is pending, um, which just means that a component is to be considered in an upcoming study. Next, we have the, the authorized status. Um, and this just means that a component with similar framework uh, was the authorized due to the lack of funding um, or, or activity. However, it is very important to highlight that this status does not preclude us of including a component under this category in a future planning implementation report. So we can still included in a, in a project. Lastly, uh, we have the completed or phase one implement, implement, implemented status, um, which it just means that a component is being partially or completely constructed and operational. Um, please also note that at the bottom left, there's a note. And I just want to highlight that a component in page two of the IDS might have an asterisk. This means that a component might have multiple phases. Next slide, please. So on this slide, uh, we have the total uh, for each category that we describe in a percentage. These totals have been updated from the 2021 IDS overview presentation uh, to reflect changes that Tabata described at the beginning. Um, like, for example, component B, uh, the San Lucy C44 uh, basin storage reservoir, which status changed from authorized design construction category to the completed or phase one implemented category. Please note that the yellow book continues to be our roadmap um, and we use the recover regions um, to evaluate uh, how the system is improving. Next slide, please. Oh, I believe that's a previous slide. Is there any next slide? There you go. Thank you very much. Um, so as part of uh, our, our forthcoming studies, I just want to highlight that uh, we have, um, like Tabata mentioned and others in this presentation, there's a forthcoming planning study that is kicking off in 2023, which is the Southern Everglades Restoration Project. Um, and as an example, uh, this component has the, this project has the potential to have SERP, uh, nine SERP components in it. And those components are listed on the slide. 
And with that, uh, that will conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you everyone for the presentations, Tabitha and team. That was um, very thorough. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. That was excellent. Now, as we concluded our presentations, we're going to move into our question and answers and public comment parts of the agenda. We will have uh, participants enter their questions into the chat feature, and Alan, and Alan Childress and April Patterson will help provide the panelists with the questions. And we'll remind the panelists to identify themselves and speak clearly into the microphone when responding to any questions. So now at this time, any of our public on the call on the Zoom can go ahead and enter questions into the chat. We'll give everybody a few minutes to find their chat button, the question and answer button on the bottom of the page. So at the bottom, this is Alan. I'm having a little bit of difficulty myself, folks. So just a moment. So at the bottom of the Zoom screen, you should have a Q and A, uh, a Q and A button, and it's got a little call out attached to it. And when you press that Q&A button, you'll get a chat screen that can open up. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a first question from Kelly Ralston. Thank you for the great overview of the IDS. Can you speak to the project timelines? What has changed since the last IDS, particularly projects that have been accelerated versus projects that have been extended? And if someone from the team wants to, um, to respond, verbally to this, um, then we can, if there are any links or anything that we need to type in um, as resources, we can do that as well. Hi there. Good morning. Kelly, Good morning, thank Eva. you for the question. Good morning. I'm going to jump in and just give a few examples. Kelly, um, great question uh, for everyone. My name is Ava Velas. I'm the chief of the ecosystem branch for the Jacksonville district. And I'd like to start by congratulating Tabitha and the whole IDS team uh, for such a great job in the launch this year. And so uh, to answer your question, Kelly, uh, I have a few examples because there's a lot. Um, and so I would offer that in uh, this fiscal year, right? We just started fiscal year 2023. Um, and so it goes from October through, through next September. We are super excited that we get to advance construction of Step South. I'm just gonna give one example because there's a lot. Um, and so we're gonna advance construction of Step South and, and as you know, um, the Water Management District did a really neat presentation at Task Force where they showed that Shark River Slough was hydrated uh, through the dry season because of all the great things that have happened with the bridges and the seepage barrier and all the other uh, efforts. And so what we get to do this coming year is we get to award contracts that help advance that even more. So um, the culverts and the L67 uh, levy uh, will go back under construction and that's happening uh, in, in the next few weeks and months. Um, and then we have the S356 pump station, which is the pump station uh, on the east side there that will deliver uh, water back to Shark River Slough and Everglades National Park. We'll start construction 
and also the S355 West spillway, which is a new spillway that will be inside the L29 that will help us regulate how water moves um, and optimize water into the park. So that's uh, some of the examples of what we've been able to advance. Back to you, Ms. Allen. Thanks, Ava, appreciate it. We have another question in from Mark Swimer. Forgive me if I mispronounced that. Will projects and plans be posted online anytime soon? For example, on the US Army Corps of Engineers website, will there be a scope of work posted for the upcoming Lake Okeechobee watershed restoration? I'll take this one as well, Ms. Allen. Good morning, Mark. Um, it's Ava again. So the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project is in its feasibility study stage. You can find all of the information. Uh, there's a very long report that we published on our website. I'm gonna ask Tabitha and the team to provide um, the website to you, Alan. Um, I'll try to find it while we're waiting. But in that report that we've published, you can find all the information on the latest uh, evolution of that plan. That plan is not yet complete. It has not yet gone uh, to Congress or has not yet achieved the chief's report stage. So it's in the feasibility stage and we'll put the link uh, available for all of you. There's a very long report uh, available with all the information. Back to you, Alan. Thank you, Ava. Um, we have a question in from Ben Olson. Have there been any changes to the work planned stormwater treatment area in the Wingate Mill STA since it was announced there would be a reevaluation? If yes, can you elaborate on the changes? If no, can you give an update on when the plans will be released? Yes. Uh, thank you, Ben, for the question uh, on Western Everglades Restoration Project. So that's another one that's in our feasibility study stage. If you look on the front page of the integrated delivery schedule, just for everyone to be on the same page, look at the very bottom of that front page, it's a big white bar. And those are the ones that are in feasibility study. That means they have not yet been completed. They have not yet gone to Congress for authorization of construction. So those are the ones at the bottom. The so Western Evergreen Restoration Project is one of those lines. Uh, ben, yes, you're right. We, we presented recently at the task force meeting in October when we were in the Washington DC that we needed to make a change to one part of the work project and that was the Wingate Mill STA. So confirming to you that the core team and the water management district team are, are working on what that would mean. We have not solved it yet because we wanna do that together with the public the tribes, our agency partners, and we're going to be actually in the next few days sending out a news release for an upcoming meeting uh, where we will all be able to talk that through. Uh, look for it in early January timeframe, although don't hold me to that because it's a, it's still uh, in the process of getting scheduled. And so to, let me make sure I got the question. The question was, are we changing? Oh, I can't see it anymore. Alan. Oh, there it is. Uh, have there been any changes to the planned STA since it was announced that we would reevaluate? Um, where we haven't landed on anything yet because we're going to do that together. So the short version is um, we're looking for options and we want to hear from all of you what you think it should be as well. And we're going to have a public meeting about that coming up soon. Um, so the changes are, are, are in progress and will be done together. And I think I answered the update on when. And so I hope that captures that one then. Back to you, Alan. Thank you, Ava. Appreciate it. If anyone else has another question that they would like typed in into the Q&A section. And while we're um, waiting, I was um, <clears throat> taking a lot of notes on Dan 
Crawford's especially his presentation. And I want to turn that flowchart into something interactive on our website so people can go, what's a palm, what's a palm, what's a palm? <laughs> and get definitions for idea. all of the, the pieces because there is going to be a lot of new terminology. It's exciting to get new terminology as we're moving towards implementation and operations. That's the exciting part. We get to learn some more. So um, I like the fact that he said it shouldn't be frightening or scary. Um, <laughs> so I appreciated the overview of that, but um, it's it's a great time to be learning new things on Everglades restoration. I am not seeing any additional questions um, coming up in the Q and A session section. James, did you want to um, pause this and head on to public comment, or give it a few more minutes? I think maybe just give it another thirty seconds or so, so people get this as last call in case somebody's having a hard time getting in or types like I do. <laughs> Absolutely. And you have a great point about turning that into something interactive on the web page. There's a number of those operational plans coming down the coming down the pipeline and they mean a lot. They abso absolutely do a lot in the system. They allow us to take advantage. They allow our water managers to take advantage of these projects. At the very least, I'll be adding all the palms to our Everglades dictionary on our homepage. So mm -hmm. try to get up with the new acronyms. Ah, we have a question in from Nyla Pipes. What happens with the TSP for WERP? And for those who don't know that, that's the tentative selected plan. Um, can you expand on that for the Western Everglades project? Good morning, Nyla. Um, thank you for the question. So the TSP is a milestone that we have achieved. And so um, that's the short, the short version to the answer. So the TSP is a milestone we've completed. And then as we uh, do another iteration of the STA itself, what we will do is that that will become part of what we publish uh, once we do it together with a PDT we will write the report and we will publish the draft report and that's the next milestone. Thank you for that, Ava. You're welcome. All right, any other questions? All right, last call. We had one slide in. We'll give last call another 30 seconds. Alan and the rest of the team, I think we can call this a close on the question and answer session, but we do have a dedicated public comment session to this meeting as well. So at this time, we'll move into that dedicated public comment section and we will ask, we will use the raise your hand feature for this. This is at the bottom of you, again, at the bottom of the Zoom screen, there is a raise the hand function. So any public that would wish to make a public comment at this time and can go ahead and use that raise your hand function. And we have a few team members identified to call on you. They will unmute you and move forward. Thank you, James. This is Sandy. So everyone will have uh, public comment limited to three minutes. So please go ahead and raise your hands now. Thank you, Sandy. I don't see any hands raised. Oh, we have one. Ronnie Bergeron. We'll need to get his mic unmuted, please. There we go. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. Well, good morning to everybody. Um, the only thing I'd like to say, and I'm speaking as an individual and representing the Bergeron Everglades Foundation, as we continue to go forward, I think Western Everglades Restoration Warp is extremely important to go forward with a few exceptions. Uh, I'm glad to hear that we're studying the uh, Wingate Mills STA, which is sitting in a, a very pristine 
environment of the uh, Kissimmee Belly, uh, one of the most impressing uh, cypress swamps in all of Florida, priority one property with century old cypress trees, uh, the most beautiful orchids. And I think it's important as we move forward that we build STAs uh, in an altered environment like we have done in the last 22 years uh, of Everglades restoration, whether it be a cane field, an orange grove, or a cow pasture to achieve quality of water for the benefit of the global uh, Everglades. So as we continue to go forward, I think it's extremely important that we all work together. There's five stakeholders involved. Number one stakeholder is the environment, God's creation. And we have the Seminoles, the Mikasukis, the private property owners, and the Big Cypress Preserve. And the important thing is, at the end of the day, uh, that we have true restoration the Big Cypress Preserve is mainly a rain-driven system, and we're in primary panther habitat, uh, primary uh, breeding ground for the panther, and the primary corridor for connectivity for the panther uh, crossing the Caloosahatchee. It's a very, very sensitive area uh, of extremely high valued uh, environment. So as, as we go forward, which is extremely important to continue to go forward, we need to all work together for the benefit of our beautiful Everglades. And thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Ronnie. Are there any other uh, public commenters? Perfect. Yeah. Short and sweet. Mm -hmm. Now, like earlier, moving the STA north. Hey, somebody please mute Ron, Kevin. Mr. Bert, there you go. Thank you, Mr. Bergeron. Pausing for a moment to have others raise their hand, other public commenters. Give everybody an opportunity. Again, that raise your hand features at the bottom of your Zoom screen. James, I believe that concludes our public comment period. I concur with that. Tabitha, you and your team have done an excellent job dissecting a very complicated document and breaking it down for us to understand. Thank you very much for that. And I would also like to turn and thank the rest of our speakers that participated today and all of our public that participated. Adam, your office and your team for handling the technology here and helping facilitate. Adam, would you like to have any closing remarks? Thanks, James. Um, yes, a big thanks to everyone on the call and the public for participation today and, and learning more. I'm sure that uh, there's um, the opportunity to follow up but later with others. But I uh, just wanted to remind everyone that the uh, OERI will be transmitting the workshop uh, today's proceedings to the core and the water management district on behalf of the working group. And that to remind you all that all of these um, proceedings are on the EvergladesRestoration.gov website. Um, and the meetings will be, uh, the video links uh, are on the um, EvergladesRestoration.gov uh, YouTube channel. And um, anyway, that's pretty much it. Thank you, James. Thank you very much, Adam. And with that, I think we can conclude today's meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.